A man with a swastika tattoo gives me a long, hard stare. It's a beautiful summer day. People around me are shuffling uncomfortably, and I don't know if it's they or I that are more uncomfortable. I put a light smile on my face, look him in the eye, and give a nod of my head to say hello. This was the way many of these encounters began that summer. In the summer of 2010, I embarked on a mission to meet with white nationalists. How did I end up there? The daughter of Indian immigrants, who had always been relatively shy growing up, attending white nationalist rallies in Sweden? Good question. I thought my career would be focused on advocating for migrant rights, galvanizing the great and the good against racism, working against far-right extremism. But as I set out on this journey, I couldn't see anyone talking to them. I couldn't see anyone talking to people in these movements to understand why they were there, why they chose lives which certainly weren't easy, to advocate for this cause, to hate people like me, to fear people like me. I didn't want to spend my career talking about them when I had never met them. How could I expect them to change if I didn't even know who they were? That's what led me to spend years immersing myself in white nationalist propaganda. And that's what led me to spend months building relationships with people in these movements. And that's what led me to that rally on that morning. It wasn't easy. Of course, there were people who didn't speak to me at first. But soon, I developed a reputation as the strange Indian woman who kept turning up to their events. <laughs> their confusion and curiosity about me seemed to open up doors. And soon, they were asking me questions, and we found ourselves getting to know one another. Now, spending time with people in these movements, surrounded by hateful thinking and racial slurs, was incredibly difficult. I found myself in rooms where I was, of course, the only person of color, listening to them talk about the need to rid society of ethnic minorities, talking about their belief that Asian, Arab, and black men were genetically wired to rape white women, talking about immigrants as a disease that needed to be eradicated. It wasn't easy. In fact, it was one of the most challenging experiences of my life. But it was a real turning point. Slowly but surely, I got to know people in the movement. They welcomed me into their homes. I met their wives, and I met their children. It was through those countless encounters, oftentimes in their own homes, that I started to see them as human beings. They were rational. They had human emotions I recognized, and they had fears. They had real stories that had led them into these movements, and not all of them wanted to be there. I started to see that if I, or anyone, stood a chance at getting these people to change their minds, that I would need to see them as human beings capable of change. Today, I've worked with dozens of people who have turned their lives around and left hate movements. I want to tell you about just one of them. This is Angela. Angela was raised in an environment where hate was normalized. In the household she grew up in, racial slurs and homophobic slurs were commonplace. So when, as a teenager, she found herself attracted to women, she was filled with an overwhelming sense of disgust for herself, and she hid it. After years of experiencing bullying and self-loathing, Angela was welcomed in by a group of neo-Nazi skinheads. They embraced her anger and provided her with a sense of community. It wasn't the hate that brought her to them. It was the acceptance. By the age of 23, covered in swastika and neo-Nazi tattoos, Angela was arrested for armed robbery of a Jewish store. She was convicted with a hate crime, and she served three years in federal prison. 
There, she experienced something completely unexpected, kindness from another inmate, a woman of color, who in a simple act of kindness invited her to play a game of cribbage. Soon, Angela found herself befriended by a group of Jamaican women. They asked her tough questions. They challenged her ideology, but they treated her with compassion. Her worldview started to crash down around her, and eventually, she would fall in love with one of those women. Today, Angela is the co-founder of an organization called Life After Hate. They work to help people leave neo-Nazi movements. She is a peace activist, and she has dedicated her life to ensuring others don't follow her path. I am proud to call Angela my friend. She inspires me and reminds me that change is possible. And Angela's not alone. There are thousands of people across the globe who have turned their lives around and left violent extremist movements. But what makes change possible? Well, over the years, I've come to see a pattern. Through the numerous studies and encounters I've had with people who have left hate behind, the common thread is human relationships. It's oftentimes a moment where they experience kindness or compassion, maybe a moment with a family member, a partner, or a child, maybe a moment with a counselor, or even a moment with a total stranger whom they thought was the enemy. It's human relationships that so often get people into these movements, and it's human relationships that I know can get people out. But what does this mean for the 21st century? where the internet has completely transformed the way humans form relationships, where social media is allowing hate to flourish in entirely new ways. We are living in an era where false rumors spread on WhatsApp have directly incited mob violence in India, where hate speech online is fueling ethnic cleansing in Myanmar, and where earlier this year, a far-right terrorist strapped a camera to his forehead and live-streamed the murder of 51 people in Christchurch, New Zealand. Facebook reported that it removed 1.5 million uploads of that video in the first 24 hours after the attack. Today, this content can spread like wildfire. And importantly, online, perpetrators are never alone. They're part of communities, networks of strangers who egg each other on and encourage each other to take acts of violence. If this is the way hate spreads in the 21st century, it begs the question, can the internet be used to foster positive connections and encounters, like the kind of encounter that helped Angela turn her life around? Well, see, I grew up being utterly unafraid of the internet. For me, it was an opportunity to connect with strangers. As a teenager in the late 90s, I remember exploring the dark corners of the internet. <laughs> Endless hours chatting to strangers in AOL chat rooms, so many of us did. And the relationships I formed online at that age were formative. I've been there and I've experienced that, and I fundamentally believe that the internet can be used to form positive connections. With that in mind, four years ago, I founded an organization called Moonshot CBE. My co-founder and I wanted to test our theories that the internet could be used to find people at risk of violent extremism and interact with them in meaningful ways, at scale. People at risk of violent extremism often leave behind a trail of clues in the online space. It's essentially a digital footprint that lets us know the path they're taking. So what we did is compile lists and databases of the hundreds of thousands of indicators of hate online, the things that make up that digital footprint, keywords and phrases that they use, racial slurs, the music they listen to, the propaganda they share. Now, I knew neo-Nazi symbols like the back of my hand, but I knew if we were going to find people who were sharing this stuff online, that we would need to bring in the techno technologists. So we set out to build a team. 
we brought in software engineers and developers to help us build tools to wade through publicly available information, to find people that, with that digital footprint, were telling us, shouting at us, that they were getting involved in violent extremism. We worked with social workers and former extremists to develop algorithms to help us assess their risk at scale. And once we set out, we found thousands of people across the globe who were at risk of violent extremism online. And not just neo-Nazis, supporters of ISIS and Al-Qaeda, Buddhist violent extremists, Hindu extremists, across ideologies. And once we found them, we wanted to interact with them, to offer them alternatives, to try and change their paths. How do we do that? Well, you know when you look up a particular pair of shoes that you might want to buy online, and then for the rest of the month, you're followed around by advertisements trying to get you to buy that exact pair of shoes? <laughs> Corporates are using advertising to get us to spend more money on a daily basis. They are using our digital footprint to match us with products they want us to buy. So in 2016, we partnered with Google's technology incubator, Jigsaw, to try and find a way to repurpose that advertising for social good. So if someone in London was searching for information about joining a white supremacy movement, that they might see advertisements offering them a safer alternative, or maybe even the chance to speak to someone like a counselor. We ran tests of this globally, and we found that violent extremists were disproportionately likely to engage with offers of social support and self-help content due to feelings of anxiety and hopelessness. White supremacists were 48% more likely than the general public to engage with this content. And if they were looking to join a neo-Nazi movement, they were 115% more likely to engage with this content. When I saw these results, I was floored. It was evidence of something I had instinctively known, that the key to starting a conversation with someone in a hate movement is not by shouting counterfacts at them, as tempting as it may be. It's by reaching out to them, appealing to their human emotions, and trying to build relationships with them. That's what led us to send teams of social workers into the online space to, to start conversations with people at risk of violent extremism. And new technology is allowing us to scale this. We are building human-in-the-loop social work messaging bots, which can help us send personalized messages to tens of thousands of people at risk of violent extremism and ensure that if any one of them responds back to us, they speak to a qualified social worker, a human being, rather than a bot. Last year, we wrapped up a pilot program to offer counseling services to neo-Nazis online in Australia. And this year, we have ambitions to reach people in all 3,142 counties in the United States of America, white supremacists in those counties, and offer them localized offers of assistance to leave white supremacy movements behind. Tattoo removals, mentors, counselors, in their own communities. New technology is allowing us to scale deeply personal and localized human interaction so that we don't need to send social workers or people like me to every single neo-Nazi rally to cross that divide and have a conversation with someone. We don't need to take those same risks, and neither do they. Today, the tech companies and social media companies are scrambling to remove violent extremist content from their platforms piece by piece. But when a post, a video, or a comment is removed, the post is deleted, not the human being. And deleting that post won't change that person's mind. So if we're going to stand any chance at eradicating violent extremism and hate, it's not just about law and order. We need to push ourselves to shift our mindsets and remember that change is possible. Not only do I believe this, but I have the evidence to prove it. Let's exploit what makes the internet so powerful, its
its ability to foster connections across human divides. And let's end the proliferation of hate and violent extremism once and for all. Thank you.